Wonderful. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of Crown World Mobility's Perspective Live series. Our webinars typically coincide with the release of our Perspectives article series. This is an opportunity to hear an additional angle on the topic straight from our own subject matter experts here at Crown. My name is Linda Fitzgerald, and I'm the Regional Marketing Manager based in Danbury, Connecticut, and I'm responsible for the marketing and branding of North and South America for Crown World Mobility. For us to quickly get started, I want to give you a couple of technical tips just to keep things running smoothly today. You will be on mute throughout the session. If you can also mute yourself, that'd be helpful. Please do so. Should you have any technical issues during the webinar, please note that my mobile number is at the listed on the right-hand side of your screen in the chat box. Please text me, text me with any questions or concerns. You will hear from me again during the question and answer period at the end of the session. Let me give you one more tip. Crown Perspective Live Webinar has CRP credits available for ERC's professional certificate, certifications. If you would like to gain credits, please write down the session number on the screen, 15674, and I'll certainly repeat it at the end of the presentation. Now I am pleased to introduce to you Crown World Mobility's Global Practice Leader for Consulting Services, Lisa Johnson. Lisa has been with Crown for over six years now and is responsible for our perspectives, articles, and Crown's industry research. She supports our clients with their mobility policy and program staff strategies and is a leader in addressing innovations and shifts impacting our industry. Lisa is one of the early thought leaders in assignment-related return on investment, diversity mobility, and in the talent mobility area. Lisa has been recognized with ERC's Distinguished Service Award and has been on the faculty of the GMST Certification Program. She is a frequent speaker and a regularly published across the industry. With no further ado, please let me hand it over to Lisa Johnson. Lisa? Thanks, Linda, and welcome, everyone. Uh, as Linda said, I am Lisa Johnson, and we are about to go through our 2019 list of global mobility trends to watch. Uh, what I hope that you're going to find interesting and actually kind of cool about our trends this year and every year is that while we always talk about a few new topics, a lot of the time our trends are familiar themes that we're revisiting because, or updating, right? Because something new is happening with them. And we need to bring the trend into today's world, into the moment, and really become familiar with the shift. So keep this in mind for this session. You know, most of you represent a corporate mobility program, and you're going to consider how these trends are either impacting you or could impact your own program and how your corporate culture and business goals will either benefit from or sometimes be a barrier to some of the topics that we'll discuss. And for some of you, you work in organizations like Crown that partner and support your own corporate clients. So you may be thinking about the companies that you work with and different ways that these trends apply or relate. So, you know, there's definitely something for everyone, but I, I you know, I want you to think about it in terms of what you're familiar with and maybe the program and strategy that you're working on right now. All right, I have broken our session today into four parts. First, I'm gonna do a really brief introduction to the trends and kind of give us a big picture theme, a couple of them really, that we wanna be thinking about that influence the trends. And second, we're gonna spend most of our time here. Most of this hour will be on covering the seven big trends that we really wanna watch and talk about this year. And finally, I'll wrap it up quickly and hopefully leave some time for questions, which Linda's gonna come back on and support us with and we'll use the chat function. So if you think of something you wanna ask, maybe jot down the idea as we're going through, or you can just put it into the chat and that way we can uh, you know, keep up with it for when we're at the end. And if for some reason we don't get to it, you're welcome to uh, email, it, email it over as well. All right, with that, let's just jump right into some background for this year's trends. I always like to start our annual trends with a theme and a quote, and this year's no different. And the reason I do this is that our industry trends reflect what's happening in business and in the larger world. Uh, so it's really important to recognize those macro, bigger picture trends and events that impact 
how, why, and where companies are moving their employees. This year's theme is transformation. It happens to be taken from the World Economic Forum that just finished in Davos, Switzerland. It's an annual meeting. Some of you may be really familiar with it. An annual meeting that brings together the minds of corporate and government leaders with innovators and leaders in technology, culture, society, and they have designated this the year of transformation. And I think it's really fitting for global mobility too. Uh, this year we still continue with geopolitical uncertainty, right? Um, the Brexit strategy is still unresolved and it's coming pretty quickly at us here in coming in March. Venezuela is rising up. There's a rise in nationalism in some places, including in the US. Um, Brazil, there's some real tension. And yet, we live and work in a time of amazing optimism. A global wave of commitment towards social and environmental responsibility is in our midst, and also a commitment to doing the right thing. Um, and with the exception of Japan, maybe a few other countries, Singapore, South Korea, mostly in Asia, we actually live and work in an increasingly younger population and workforce. And we're also firmly established in a digital world, right? And highly connected with technology, and that's driving innovative ways of working. So I choose to start us off with a quote probably from the past year with Albert Einstein, who explored new options, new ways of thinking, new notions of truth. And he starts us off with some wisdom regarding change and innovative thinking. And I think it should be our mantra as we're going through transformation this year within our program. So here's Einstein's uh, complex idea here for us to think about. If you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. All right, that's a good, uh, uh, hopefully it's inspirational for you to, to seize the change that's in front of us. So we have an imperative to transform and to change in global mobility. And this year more than ever, and I hope that I'm gonna touch on some ways that you might consider doing that or hopefully maybe aligned with some of the things that you're thinking about in your own programs, your own organizations, or the clients that you work with. So here we go, our first trend is the increasingly important employee experience. Now, honestly, there are very few industries that don't have employee experience on their priority list. Uh, employees' expectations are evolving. And as we start with this trend, I wanna suggest that this first trend, the increasingly important employee experience, is going to influence all of the other trends that we talk about this year and all of the other trends that we're gonna talk about in the next hour, you will see its influence in sort of the why behind some of the other trends that we talk about, right? So let's, let's dive into it. Now, more than ever before, there's a need for companies to offer an engaging, emotional, human-centered experience in the workplace. This is true at what are often called pivotal moments, right? Recruiting, onboarding, career planning, even when an employee is leaving the company, these are pivotal moments and there's the need for all organizations in any industry to offer an engaging, emotional, human-centered experience. So today, companies in every industry are raising the bar with creative ways to engage and retain talent and to improve the employee experience. And I want you to think about it in your own organizations. How are you seeing this manifest itself in your own organizations? So what does this have to do with mobility? Well, an international move, whether it's domestic, international, permanent, temporary, within an organization is another example of one of those pivotal moments, right? Uh, a big career moment that the employee and their family, if they're accompanied, will always remember. So we're seeing that for many of our clients and for our own customer experience strategy with our own team here at Crown, these strategies all involve putting an infrastructure in place to provide the information and the support specific to the transit that's underway, in our case, global mobility, right? Um, and then taking this concept to the next level with creative out-of-the-box ideas. So I wanna just look at a few examples when it comes to the ex employee experience, uh, and there are numerous aspects of mobility where we see this being addressed 
and improved. So I put a few up here on your screen. Our article describes this more in detail as well, and you'll all receive a copy of that. But um, I just put a few up here for the sake of our conversation, just to inspire you. Of course, we could add any number of bullet points under each of these pivotal moments within mobility. So within an international assignment or transfer, uh, we, um, there are just natural places to support the employee's experience and the mobility stakeholders' experiences. So I want to point out a few examples. Let's start there on the left with the moments even before somebody has agreed to move. Pre-decision. Now, a number of companies, uh, and maybe some of you, have uh, started to recognize how critical it is to have an informed decision-making process, even before someone's agreed to go. So a pivotal moment, a way to enhance the experience, in, in many cases comes with providing managers with guidance to help them in, with selection to identify more qualified candidates, uh, right? So it may be in presenting them with whether it's guidelines or conversation, creating some awareness around that to help them with selection, because uh, we know that the traditional way of selecting someone is, are you willing to go and are you technically qualified? But there, we know that around that there are some other things that can be looked at to find qualified candidates. Another way that companies are addressing this is maybe to develop those qualified candidates in a candidate pool. So perhaps it's requiring or offering in their L&D program some training programs that prepare people who assume that they're on an international or global career path, or they're looking, uh, they're, um, they are maybe in diversity inclusion. There are some domestic versions of a d diversity inclusion training that sometimes is required. And there are global ones around working effectively in a global organization, things like that. So they might add that to their L&D. Uh, or, uh, you know, companies might provide ways for the employee and the family to better understand the impact of the decision that might have on their finances or their cultural fit. So I'm talking about these, but I also want to think about what are some creative ways in my organization, in your organizations, that you might do that. Um, just this morning I was reading about some gamification technology coming out um, to help parents be better parents. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we had some gamification app, you know, program where you could maybe on the decision making, what you know, in looking at, well, what's the impact on my on an international assignment or an international transfer or domestic transfer uh, on my career, on my family, on my finances. So let's look, you know, I'll be excited if somebody has that to uh, share with everyone and if it comes out next year. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is I'm putting up some things that for many of us may know to be true, but we've got to think about some new ways of, of, of providing these, of coming up with these. And if you're not doing much in that pre-decision pivotal moment, maybe this year is the year to say, what's one thing that I can do to address this better uh, and, and enhance the employee experience, right? The second pivotal moment with temporary or permanent move is what we're seeing with onboarding the employee. Now, onboarding is something that we are seeing really, uh, it has a lot of buzz around it in our industry this year. There's been a book that's been published giving people examples of onboarding. Uh, there is, it's on every conference agenda uh, is the onboarding of the employee into the global mobility program. So, um, and you can ask anyone whose role is working directly with an employee and their partner or spouse uh, about the early stages of a move or an assignment. And they can certainly tell you if the company is doing a great job with mobility onboarding, having everything I need to set up to introduce points of contact, to present resources, to set expectations, to know what's going to happen, uh, that that's a really critical, pivotal moment. And are we doing anything interesting or creative, or is it, our, remember our Einstein quote, are we doing the same thing we've always done? <laughs> so it's a, that may be the moment, the, the pivotal moment you want to tackle this year to just enhance that employee experience. The third moment right there in the middle up at the top is the, what I call the soft landing, but when you, once somebody gets onto their assignment or gets to their new location. So really focused on getting up and running, but also companies providing a strategy for the receiving manager, the receiving office. So, you know, 
if you look at the fact that it, there's different volumes going into different offices in your own organization, and some people have, everyone's going to have a different way of receiving a new employee. It's similar to onboarding, right, where your your organization has some specific activities that need to happen when anyone comes into the organization, no matter where they join your company. And the same could be true for international assignments. So providing some guidelines, the minimum or, or you know, uh, requirements or suggestions for how to receive someone who's coming into your office because of a transfer, whether it's permanent or temporary, whether it's international or domestic, that can go a long way in making sure that there is some consistency in how that happens. Uh, there are many stories, and if any of you work directly with your employees going on international assignments or moving with your company, you know that while we hope that in most circumstances there is a, a general welcome and a way to bring them in and into the new location, help them get adjusted, uh, there are plenty of people with stories about the fact that they arrived somewhere, no one really knew they were coming. There wasn't a computer ready for a week or two. Then maybe there wasn't an office for them to sit in or a desk. No one invited them to lunch or introduced them around. So it doesn't always happen consistently. Consistently. Um, let's just quickly hit a couple of the other examples here. As I said, this is really just to give you a taste for what I'm talking about in identifying some of those pivotal moments in your program and saying, I want to focus on this one right here. Maybe it's the ongoing support. Maybe it's the pre-decision. And I want to come up with some creative ways to enhance the employee experience, right? Uh, so post-arrival, I, I call these drum beats. But once somebody's settled in and they're going along, they're ha it's a great opportunity for that enhanced employee experience to be able to have some drum beats to reach out to employees. Maybe it's around career planning, updating objectives, maybe three months into their arrival in the new location, it's checking in with them and saying, how is it going? Getting some kind of feedback on their experience, helping them to identify new skills. Maybe it's getting ready for repatriation after you know, a year before they're about to return, if it's an international assignment that's temporary. And then repatriation, which to me, repatriation could be a bullet in every single one of these pivotal, pivotal moments, because starting before someone even goes on an international assignment or transfers, if it is temporary, then they need to think about what's next. Uh, what, you know, what's going to happen to me after this? What am I working towards? And how am I going to uh, prepare for that? And who are the stakeholders who need to be involved? Um, but repatriation also goes a year or two after their international experience for your temporary assignments because you want to make sure that they and you, the organization, are getting some ROI, right? So you might think about, well, what, you know, a pivotal moment being one year after the assignment. Let's look at how they're leveraging their international experience, how they were onboarded onto their new team, how the company is benefiting from their uh, from their. Um, new competencies, anything like that. All right, so I think you get the point. And the big takeaway for me around the engage, uh, engaging, emotional, human-centered experience, really, um, is that uh, no one can afford to rely on their typical standard approaches, and we need new ways to get employees' feedback and input and enhanced ways to meet their needs. So my goal for all of us on this on this session today uh, is that when we meet up in internal meetings with business partners or we're at an external event like an ERC or an SEM or attending one of Crown's roundtables, that you're able to share with your peers, uh, with uh, those in the industry, something cool, something creative that you're doing differently in your program in order to enhance the employee experience in mobility. All right. Now, remember I said that that first trend is going to be really an underlying thread to influence all of our trends this year. So our second trend to watch for 2019 is technology. No surprise, this is the kind of trend that now will be perennial on anyone's friends list, right? So this year I want to focus on something specific, and that's the technology intended to supplement and simplify and enhance. So uh, I actually read an article this week that talked about the latest technology unicorns. Have you heard of those, which are those technology startup companies that are highly valued? And you know, in the past five or six years, many of those 
hugely successful technology startups were companies that simply took an existing business, like a taxi or food delivery or hotels, and made it mobile. Really disruptive, really interesting and very new way of thinking about a business. But today, many tech startups are focusing on basically software for specific industries like banking or farming that just need to be modernized, need to be brought into, you know, have to the technology support for it. That's where we really are with technology in mobility. Doesn't mean there aren't going to be a few innovative pieces out there, but in general, I think most of the technology that we're looking at is just how to update uh, and um, uh, our industry and modernize it. Um, so let's, you know, take a look at that, because definitely there are some of you and some companies that are leading the charge in this area, and others are catching up. And we know we work with a wide range of companies that are at many different stages in this technology transformation journey. So maybe this is going to make some of you feel like, wait, I'm really ahead of here in our organization, or companies to say, wow, we haven't gotten started really on, you know, on this. That's okay. What we find in looking at and doing some research on this topic with our wide range of clients is that there are a lot of people in different in different stages, and only a very small few that are in that very innovative, leading edge uh, group. And we applaud you. Uh, so today, employees across almost any generation have similar expectations when it comes to wanting to convince con the convenience and the simplicity of having information at their fingertips and available on their devices. It's not just the early career millennials or the now emerging Gen Zs, um, but they certainly are influencing expectations too. All right. I love this quote from Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple, of course, and it's a great example of just the importance of the voice of a customer driving evolving technology to support the customer. Uh, and so, you know, one of the ways that we see this trend most in our industry is in the technology solutions in, that are emerging that are intended for uh, you all, our corporate customers, but also your employees who are moving. Um, and in the solutions out in the market that we see with our partners, our clients, our competitors, uh, and I'm sure uh, you all see this too. It's technology intended to supplement, simplify, and enhance the employee experience. So let's just look at a few uh, examples here of mobility technology solutions that have emerged or are emerging to support that convenience and simplicity. So right there on the right. Let's just take a few trends that seem most salient these days um, that we can probably identify with uh, in a wide range of companies. So that support for lump sums and cash allowances. It is, as many of you know, a trend. We've talked about it for a couple of years now. It's increasingly common for companies to offer cash options in lieu of organized relocation support, especially to their early career employees. Although when we think about a flexible policy, even for more, you know, mature uh, career moments and, and, uh, and not, not necessarily someone in early career, when a more traditional move, we still are seeing more cash allowance flexibility there. So in general, there is more of this cash allowance and for the early career employees, the lump sum approach. Um, there's a strong need for the employees to better manage those allowances. That's been a missing solution in our industry. So I can think back many years and the companies that were using lump sum, say, for domestic U.S. relocation, often you think that they're the people who have the least set of needs uh, and uh, are really, you know, excited about their freedom to use their cash how they want, but they're often the ones that we hear from the most uh, coming back and saying, but give me some guidance on this. Um, so more and more solutions are emerging around this. Uh, and to that end, even at Crown, we, you know, we know even a few years ago that that was something that was needed. We have a new tool called Flex, and it's a platform that many companies out there are offering this technology now. It's a way to support the employee experience at this pivotal moment, and if you're giving them lump sums or cash, it's great to have some sort of dashboard there that helps guide people on what to spend it on, what my options are, how much I have left, and really capture it there in a visual way, right? Um, and what we have found with technology is that most corporate 
most companies with global mobility programs are not developing this technology themselves. For the most part, they're looking externally for it. All right, the middle example on the right, virtual options for services. So in preparing for this session, I was remembering not so long ago, at least for me in my lifetime, doing expense reports for my business trips and, and taping receipts to pieces of paper and faxing them, which for those of you under 35 is just an old fashioned way of scanning. <laughs> but faxing those receipts to a service center to be looked at and, you know, did you get it and all of that. Today, I mean, the technology is there. I take a photo on my phone. I bet a lot of you do the same thing. I upload it right into Concur in the moment. With our healthcare, we can do some of the same things, right? With our uh, expen expenses that we can um, um, submit right there on the phone, taking a picture, uploading. It's so simple. Uh, and I know you could all give examples. So when I think about global mobility technology that's emerged, emerged, if we just look at the virtual aspects, right, virtual home surveys in case someone doesn't want to schedule someone to come into their home or they need it for more flexible timing um, or, you know, for whatever reason, uh, there's a preference to, and always looking to have that option for the virtual home surveys, virtual destination tours. Virtual training, virtual options for policy counseling, virtual job interviews in our organizations, right? Um, virtual team meetings. I think anyone in a global team or a geographically dispersed team is going to have virtual team meetings today. Virtual banking. You know, these are things that used to be a novelty. Now it's assumed that we can do this. It saves time. It's convenient. It gives a low-cost option to the face-to-face. -face. Doesn't mean it replaces face-to-face, -face, but it gives you that low-cost option. All right, third example there on the right of your screen is the technology to simplify the process. So for a lot of your organizations, and here at Crown too, I can think of ways that say robotics is being used now in billing or finance in order to, you know, take on repeatable, repetitive activity. Um, oh, and one relatively new technology that's emerged is something that we now have called e-packing, and I bet you, you see that in a lot of places. It's, where you can just scan uh, the tag on a box, right? It's so clear how much more efficient it makes our packers' lives. They don't have any more handwritten lists to put into the system, the tracking the boxes. And, you know, when you add new technology, whatever it is, into a process um, that has been manual in the past, you – uh, you probably find something similar to us, which is just that the team's morale is up, you, your employees feel more agile, the job factor becomes a bit cool, um, new devices to get the job done. Uh, I, I, I think we're just going to see more and more of this, but I just wanted to share with you, you know, what you're probably seeing and experiencing in terms of that idea that we need, we're modernizing every aspect of global mobility. The one last thing that I want to share with you on this particular trend is a, a, a place where we see probably the slowest evolution of technology within the global mobility area. Um, and uh, I think that everyone can give examples of technology solutions that simplify a previously manual process. But let me just share a couple more examples here. Some of you may remember that in our 2018 annual survey, we had a section on asking if companies have uh, made any significant changes to the format of their policy program or program communication in recent years in order to make it more user-friendly um, and bring it into modernity, as you would, or any just any changes. And what we found was less than 25% of companies have made any real changes. So what you're seeing on the screen here are of those less than 25%, what kinds of changes have the companies that have made changes made, right? So we can see a lot of people, of course, are using email to communicate, adding an intranet site there, 58%. I think the companies that said we, that they were more innovative and leading edge, that number may go up another 10 uh, to 15 points there in terms of having an intranet site. Text adding into social media, communities, into um, their global mobility population, uh, th things like that. So the findings confirm that 
global mobility is really still lagging behind HR and sales and other functions within their own organizations. But I think this year we're going to see a lot of headway. And one reason is because we are seeing your expectations change and you're seeing your employees' demands for making things simpler, you know, uh, change as well. It's all linked to increasing that increasingly important employee experience. And the point is that quickly we're going to see employees, your employees, uh, expecting forms and policies and information to be simple and technology driven. And in a lot of cases, they already do. Think about how they deal with your, you know, the paperwork they get from HR or from performance management processes. I mean, it's all really changing. Now, just before I leave the technology trend, I want to like say yes, but. So I want to remind you that technology supported solutions of course, they're going to continue to emerge, improve, amaze us. Employee demands will increase. However, the person-to-person -person engagement is going to continue to play a critical role. Uh, relocation, as we all know, is a highly emotionally charged experience. And we're always going to be both. So really, I think our industry is going to be at the forefront of balancing human technology interaction and human-to-human -human interaction. Uh, even early studies with um, uh, AI and the world of algorithms and analysis are saying that some of the most critical skills that are going to be needed in that world of making us smarter and working with data analytics and all, some, the two of the most important skills that jobs are going to be hiring for is communication and empathy things that don't necessarily come as naturally uh, to a robot, right? So we will always have that both, and I really think that uh, our, our industry is, is always, has always been ahead in that, and we're going to lead the way with that balance, human technology interaction and human to human. Okay. Our third trend is going to be a little shorter, I promise, because we're, we've been talking about this theme. It's evolving, not emerging new this year. We've had it on our radar and our lists for a few years now and done some research in this area too, flexibility and choice. So let's just look at what aspects of it we want to talk about this year, because I think there's some really interesting things, you know, to pause and say, you know, what are we do what's happening with this trend, flexibility and choice. Um, it's, again, stemming from a larger trend outside of our industry that's influencing the direction of global mobility. So how many of you have stayed in those hotels or at least seen the ads, which I have, where you can now reserve your room, pick which room, uh, the direction that it faces, choose the colors on the wall, choose the art on the wall, the pillow firmness, the softness, uh, convenience and customization. And we're at a stage where everyone likes to buy things, maybe using Venmo or WePay. Some people prefer to go into the stores. I, other times, the same people want to buy on Amazon, online options. Today, we go out to eat. We can order gluten-free. We can order vegan. So many options. Uh, I think about my teenager who, you know, can customize sneaker colors and designs. Um, when we book a flight, you can choose, you know, not just first class and economy, but premium economy. Choice is king. So, of course, why wouldn't our employees, our customers, our business partners expect choices from us? Um, and you expect choices from your relocation management companies like Crown and whoever else you're, you're using, right, your partners. We expect choices. So here we go. Let's just count the ways that we can see flexibility and choices pretty easily and readily within global mobility. If you look at the top row, those top boxes across the top of the screen, in your organizations, the business leaders in HR, let's just start with those first two there on the left, they demand choices. They want to segment the assignments. They want some move options to be low cost, some to be VIP. They want choices in policy or levels of support for different needs and budgets, right? They're looking, can we have lump sum? Could we have local to local, local plus? In Asia, we see that a lot. Uh, Long-term, short-term, your business partners want to meet different employee needs so that they can recruit. We're getting the right people to go on their assignments or to transfer. We're breaking down barriers in certain regions. 
or breaking down the barriers for certain types of employees. So maybe your HR and business partners are looking to increase the future leadership pipeline and they need you to have a program that will allow them to increase the number of women on international assignments or support LGBT community members uh, or young people. Or, or in Asia, we definitely see, and some of you in your programs probably see, those employees whose parents live with them or depend on them and they need them to be eligible to go on the assignment too. Uh, or employees whose children have special needs. Dual career couples, so many things that our business partners want us to be able to support in our global mobility programs, right? They need choice, they need flexibility. But they're on that gray top box, the employee, we can't forget about them, of course they want choice. They're asking you questions like, could I have my language training given virtually? Right? Guess what? You can. Could I get the furniture when I arrive in Hong Kong and not ship things? Could I bring a pet? Could I use my money on two home trips if my manager lets me instead of temporary housing? Could I have a roommate? You know, a lot of the early career employees, we're seeing this with the employees, your employees who are coming right out of grad school, and maybe they're in an urban environment, but they're looking for us to show them options of housing with roommates because they want it for the social reasons, for the cost, uh, for you know many different reasons to have a roommate. Choices and flexibility. So we have a lot of information on this topic and our article will go into more detail. I think you, you, you are following it. Um, it's a trend. Now let's look at the impact it has on our roles, that flexibility and choice. Because our fourth trend is a direct result of flexibility and choices. And many of you have heard me talk about this before. Uh, the role of the global mobility professional at every level is becoming more advisory. And frankly, for those of you, I see some of your, the names of the people on this session today, and you, some of you who have been around for a little while, you know that the evolution of the global mobility professional, it's a continual process. It isn't what it was 10 years ago. It wasn't, isn't what it was 20 years ago. Um, it's certainly evolving. But right now, this big burst of, uh, of requirement for flexibility and choice has really made a difference in terms of our role and it becoming more advisory. So let's just look at some of the ways that's happening. Um, an increase from business and employee demands are requiring our function, the global mobility function, to advise and support de decision makers in new ways. Um, so it's true for HR as a function in general. Employees are demanding more on their employers for advice to help them leverage their specific needs. That's for sure. And flexibility and choice of any kind it can empower, it's really positive, right? It empowers, it gives independence, it opens up mobility to more people, so many good things. But flexibility and choice also add complexity. So let's look at it in two ways, for, for the business and HR leaders. Our research shows that they are often making decisions based on budget, not the employee need, right? And therefore, a flexible policy requires global mobility teams to provide guidance and a rationale behind those decisions. That could be in guidelines, it could be in a conversation, a PDF form, it could be in something that you click through. We have a new um, interactive you know, policy format or guideline format where you can click on a link and say, okay, I'm making this decision, I have these choices, what's the rationale behind it? And they can read it. Or maybe, as I said before, we could, we'll end up with a gamification app where they can look at what their choices are and what it means to different kinds of employees, right, down the road in the future. We have to be able to think about when you hear the word guideline or policy, you have to think about it in a different way than the traditional um, ways. It's not just necessarily a piece of paper, although that can work if that's what you have. Um, but giving guidance and, to the, and rationale behind decisions. For our employees, they don't always know what they don't know. We find, as I mentioned earlier, that early career employees may need fewer services, but typically they need more guidance. That's a paradox, right? But it means that global mobility professionals are needed as advisors to any of these stakeholders. So I think we've covered a lot of the things on this, uh, on this particular slide, some of the guidance and support, the different options out there. 
for the employee getting lump sum, they might need that technology tool to help them manage the cash and the choice options, right? For the business managers, maybe some guidelines, communication to rationalize choices. Global mobility team, do you need to hire people with, you know, next time you have an opening, are you gonna look for people with more of a consultative advisor skill to the job description and add that to a job description. Or maybe upskill our current team. How are we gonna advise our customer on their choices? We need new ways of working, new types of questions that we need to ask our uh, business partners, right? And just to increase communications, increase FAQ lists. Uh, of course, right now we know that chatbots replacing FAQ lists in your programs are not happening so, uh, I think maybe less than 3% of companies have those now, but so they're a little slower to emerge, but once the technology evolves, which is gonna happen quickly, we'll probably see that normalized for mobility programs too. Imagine all your flex FAQ lists becoming more a chatbot format. Um, and I certainly see videos uh, emerging, we use them internally at Crown, we use them, you know, for explaining things to uh, our customers. You probably are using them more as well. We see them on LinkedIn. It's video, the use of video is definitely on the rise and that's kind of an, an, an easy win as well. All right, now we're on our fifth of seven trends this year and this is the dual career couples. It is not new to phenomena in global mobility. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but I just wanna to touch on it because I wanna raise your awareness. And if you're doing something creative around this, I also want you to, you know, I wanna encourage you to share some of those things with all of us, with your peers, with our industry, um, with each other. Uh, it's reappearing in 2019 because honestly, I've had more conversations on this topic with many of you and around the globe this year not this year, 2019, but this year, the last 12 months. <laughs> and I'm just hearing more about the struggles and challenges that dual career couples, that demographic bring. Those are your employees who have partners who also have their own careers and how that is a barrier. Now, it's been around for a while. I just think it's now, you know, there are pain points for companies that with this. So what's different this year? the economic and family impact on a couple as a result of mobility is greater than ever before. When an employee is asked to move, the partner has to give up, put on hold, search for a new job. In, and in more cases than ever before, that means they're gonna give up an income source that's significant. Uh, it's definitely identified as one of the top three challenges for female assignees in that mid-career level, right? And for LGBT assignees with partners. Another challenge comes from immigration regulations, partner work authorization. Currently, the EU and UKI, at least for the next, what, six weeks, four weeks, they, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not funny, but they actually still have that free movement of people. But that's central to the Brexit negotiations. It's central, right? Um, around the globe, there are only 30 countries that are accompanying partners to work uh, when they arrive with their partners on an international assignment. Um, but in many cases, like the US, this is only for married partners, not for unmarried partners. And even in the US, our immigration team was pretty quick to remind me that it's, uh, the government's working on taking that away. So changes happen, and some changes are really positive. Probably many of you heard about the pivotal uh, landmark ru ruling in Hong Kong in uh, July of last year that allows dependent visa status for same-sex partners. But it's not the norm in most countries. So I, what can we do about it? There are a lot of ways that companies can support it. Again, I don't have to spend tons of time on this, but let's just look at kind of five things that pop up in this area to think about. And maybe some of you are facing this as well or are handling this in similar ways. Split families right there on the top left-hand side, it's definitely on the rise. It was something that we saw very frequently in Asia over the past five, six years, uh, but now we're seeing it more around this dual career scenario where the employee moves, but the family stays behind. It's a workaround, right? It's a workaround. Now, another workaround that you see is applying a commuter alternative there on the lower left-hand side 
the commuter alternative to what should be a permanent transfer or a temporary move because of the dual career issues. That's something that I've heard a lot of our clients talking about that they've put in place. They're just using the commuter policy much more frequently. Um, and uh, it's also, a, you know, a diversity issue, as I said, with the family's LGBT partners too. Um, so really it's a time to uh, assess what support you're giving to your employees, what that you have in your policy and your program around accompanying partner demographics, uh, and also a great opportunity for you to get some feedback and input from your employees who are moving or have recently moved around the dual career issue. See if it is an issue that is, you know, play. talk to your business um, managers as well. Maybe they're having employees opt out of the opportunity before you even hear about them. So you're not aware of how frequently that happens too. Uh, that last icon on the bottom right is just that it's a great time to um, right, increase your, the awareness around this, um, to do some educating on it. Uh, hopefully it's a breakout year for innovative solutions. Um, I will say, interestingly, that industries, those of you in industries with highly educated employees, meaning that they needed maybe a PhD, like a pharmaceutical or technology industry, um, it's almost guaranteed that the employee's partner also has a significant career. So that is some of the industries where we're seeing this really heightened as a barrier and something that they are uh, really looking for in new solutions around and having to do these workarounds. All right, I hope you're having fun with this year's trends. Um, I'm saving the best for last year. It's our six out of seven trends this year, and we're talking about employee well-being and duty of care. And just one second, I'm just gonna. Okay, so let's just go into our last uh, of the trends here. I'm saving the best for last. And we're talking about employee well-being and duty of care. So I'm going to spend more time on employee well-being. We've talked about duty of care before. I just want to give you a quick update on that. But there are two notable workplace shifts uh, that we are watching here. First, today's employees increasingly expect to work in an environment that enables them to establish a work-life balance. And I know, don't roll your eyes for some of you. Of course, we know about the work-life balance. The concept of work-life balance, as many of you know, is no longer limited to just flexible work hours or maternity leave. It's really broadened. The other reason has to do with this growing definition of duty of care and the impact of the do-it-yourself DIY choices on, you know, concern for the employee's experience and well-being. All right, but let's start with employee well-being as a whole. Corporate culture, HR strategy, they've been increasing focus on employee well-being and it's being broadened to incorporate mental and physical well-being with an understanding that it can increase productivity. This is in the general population. So uh, it's a recognition that younger employees, Gen Z especially, but uh, millennials too, want to work for companies that share their social values. As a result of all of this, uh, not just for those generations, but they're pushing some of this, benefits are expanding. So we all work, probably many of us work under the HR umbrella. Um, and so we're familiar with a lot of this. Companies are offering yoga. They're offering fresh food options. I read recently about a company that said that in their cafeteria, they offer subsidized lunches, subsidized food. But if you choose the healthier choice, it's more subsidized than not. So the grilled chicken is cheaper than the fried chicken, for example, encouraging mental and physical well-being, smoking cessation, paternity leave. Did you all hear last week, uh, and it may just have been new to me, but paternity leave <laughs> for your dogs. Um, but it includes updated technology options for getting the job done, right? That's about employee mental and, and well-being, that I have uh, modern devices and, and ways to do this. I'm not doing the same forms over and over again by hand manually. That's part of this umbrella of employee well-being. And then updating the work environment to provide common areas, maybe those 
we're seeing so many more of those high top tables, like in a coffee shop or long communal tables, alternative lighting, green spaces. You walk in an office for a job interview, you're like, yeah, wow, this is cool. I want to work here. Creating more of that innovative garage kind of atmosphere, right? Uh, or the we work kind of atmosphere. Um, I was visiting a, one of our clients recently and they had swings and, and bean, bag, bean bag chairs facing out to a, a beautiful view and the IT help desk was set up. It was more like a Starbucks inside their office. It, there was a counter where instead of ordering your coffee, you order your IT help desk support and you can then sit out on a table while you wait for whatever is happening to your device or to recharge it. Uh, it was really cool. Um, so, and actually Crown has started a whole new business area outside of world mobility called Crown Workspace and it, that it's grown out of this same trend. So we're seeing this in all of our organizations and there, and so I want you to ask yourself, all right, in what ways are we seeing more of a focus on employee well-being in our organization? And now let's think about it in terms of mobility. The great thing for mobility, and just to spend another second on this, is that because global mobility, because of the way our industry has evolved and what we are supporting, this relocation, we already have a lot of well-being strategies right there in our typical policy and program. What needs to happen this year, so I'm giving you like, the, here's a checklist of things, many of these are already in your program, right? This, what needs to happen is you have to rebrand it now. You have to rebrand it maybe with some of your own bigger companies, employee well-being brands that are already out there. Your marketing teams have already done the work. Your HR team has already done the work. How do you rebrand some of these so that you're aligned with this bigger trend in your organization? And then keep going, come up with some creative options, just like our HR and our organizations have to do that to attract and retain talent, engage them with employee well-being solutions of all kinds. We have to do the same in our industry and in your program. All right, so there's some more discussion around this in our article, uh, and I want to hear about some of the creative things that you do with this concept, because you're dropping a quick win if you don't focus on a little bit of rebranding of a signee well-being within your global mobility program and taking advantage of this trend and adding it in there. All right, DIY, what I said was, you know, we want to keep our eye on this. We want to really follow what some of the challenges are. Most of our clients are still hesitant to give up vetted suppliers for temporary living as opposed to like an Airbnb or, uh, you know, unregulated choices. But some of you have enough millennials really pushing for this. Employees are growing impatient with wanting these options to be available in policy. Um, and you have to ask who's liable for what. So what I encourage you to do right now, if you haven't already done it, is just to look in your policy and your employee communications and make sure that you have both of those updated to reflect your company's policy on your DIY use of Airbnbs and Ubers and, you know, kayaks and things like that. If you let people do it, great. Make sure it's in there and explain to what the liability is, what your policy is. If you don't let people do it, make sure you're addressing it. You can't have a policy that doesn't describe this uh, this in there in some way, even if it's to say we don't approve of it. All right, so that's a quick win too. You can put that on your to-do list for first quarter this year, right? All right, our final one, we save the best for last, and then I promise I'll leave you a couple of question time, seconds for questions here at the end. Remember, you're gonna use your chat bot, so you, chat bot, you're going to use the chat function there on the right of your screen, so you can start chatting some things in, and Linda is going to help me out with that in just a second. But let me just focus on this last trend, and this is diversity and inclusion, and it's really mobility DNI. This is Crown's fifth year of tracking and supporting the industry's discussion around mobility DNI. It's something we feel passionate about. And each year we highlight new ways that we see companies embracing the reality that corporate diversity and inclusion strategies need to be reflected and supported by talent mobility programs. The tagline that you see on this slide uh, is about making global careers more accessible. 
uh, some of you may have seen my LinkedIn post yesterday, and it was an article just describing some of the diversity and inclusion emojis that are being launched this year. Uh, as somebody said, it's about time, but they're really cool and they're, you know, they're needed now. And it, it's hard to believe sometimes when you look at them that some of those emojis haven't already been there before. But most global companies require international experience as part of their leadership track. So it's clear that if the company's assignment or mobile population does not reflect the diversity or the employee population of the employee population, then future leadership will probably not reflect it either. And those less represented members of the population won't be reflected either. So we have some really good news, and I'm going to end with some of this good news. First of all, three other trends within these seven trends we've talked about today really support the ability to have a diversity mobility strategy, a focus on enhancing the employee experience, since your company is prioritizing that, your business leaders, your HR, uh, it makes sense to have, you know, that you're, it will support diversity mobility goals. Flexible policy and choices, really critical to having a great diversity mobility program. And assignee well-being and duty of care on the agenda. And so those are things that would be addressed in diversity and mobility as well. So what is it? Well, of course, every company is going to have their own priorities around diversity and inclusion strategies. Don't reinvent the wheel. This is something that if your company already is focused on, you can pick the priorities that they have and really say, hey, let, these should be our, you know, areas of focus this year. Or just be able to say our policy is flexible enough that we can meet the needs of different employee demographics, of different areas of focus, of our outbound employees from emerging markets, of our uh, female assignees with uh, accompanying male partners, uh, of our early career employees, that you know, whatever it, it is, we're going to have enough flexibility in our program to support a multi-generational workforce our regional talent, whatever it is. I want you to look at that bottom box there, which is supporting mobility opportunities for employee disabilities, because that's probably the area of diversity that has uh, gotten the least amount of focus for global mobility, and it's employees with visible and non-visible disabilities. So this year, I really want to uh, have that conversation here at Crown and with those of you out in our industry, you who are our peers, our clients, our uh, people working in our industry, and let's have a conversation about ways to make our programs more inclusive. Um, some of you are already leading the way, and some of you are just getting started, uh, and uh, it's, it's a great way to, uh, to a great area for us to focus on this year. If you're getting started or you're already there, I'm including a checklist. It's in the article that you will get as a, after the, when we launch our Perspectives Live with a more in-detailed uh, description of all these trends. Some of these may be really familiar to you, like having unconscious bias training for your selection manager, since you already have it for your re recruiters, you already have it in your company, add it to selection managers or your global mobility team. But creating tips, those last two there, you know, get input from your employees. Don't reinvent the wheel. If you want to add, say, diversity, mobility for uh, employees with disabilities or family members with disabilities, have a focus group with that population and get their their input. You don't have to recreate the wheel. And um, This is a, an opportunity to get input from the different diversity, mobility areas that you want to focus on this year. All right, I'm ending here. I am delighted that you've, you've been here on this session. And Linda, I'm going to hand it right back over to you so we can see if there's time for even one quick question. Yes, I think we um, have one of these. Let's see, we have, um, I work in an industry there, where there aren't a lot of women and in our company only 1% of our employee population are female. Should we be measuring for female assignees? Oh, so it's a really good question, and, uh, you know, clearly it's not going to have the same, it's going to have a different kind of focus. So not measuring saying are 50% of our international assignees women when only 1% of your entire population is. And we certainly see that in engineering, in the oil and gas industry. Um, however, if your organization in your diversity and inclusion 
strategy is focused on the recruitment and retention of women, then you certainly want to be measuring it, just not using a an egal, you know egal, a, a measurement of 50-50, but just measuring the inclusion of women and what you're doing to break down those barriers and to support their careers. So that's a great question. All right, we're here at the top of the hour. Oh, I see a lot of people jumping off. So Linda, I'll let you just kind of wrap us up and uh, and thank you all so much for your uh, participation today. Thanks, Lisa, great job. Hi everyone, this is Linda Fitzgerald again. We are at the end of this Perspective Live session. I hope that you have enjoyed it. We always look forward to sharing our annual trends with you. Remember that you can receive CRP credits for the ERC certificate and the number is 15674. All of our Perspectives articles are posted on the CWM website and all of you on today's webinar will receive an email when it's launched in the coming week. You will also receive a feedback form. Please let us know what you think and what topics you'd like to hear about in the future events. Thanks so much for attending Crown's Perspective Live series and a big thanks to my colleague, Lisa Johnson. Until next time, have a great day.